Hi, in this video let's discuss various anatomical landmarks of a tooth and related multiple choice questions. So coming to the first anatomical landmark that is cusp. So a cusp is an elevation or mound on a crown. A mound is nothing but a heap like structure. So similarly we find heap of enamel on the crown structure. So we have various cusps on occlusal surfaces. So in this clinical picture we can clearly appreciate the cusps right. So usually cusps are present on posterior teeth on premolars as well as in case of molars. Next coming to the other term that is tubercle. A tubercle is a smaller version of a cusp. It's a smaller elevation present on any part of crown and it's formed because of extra deposition of enamel. Right. So in this image you can see a tubercle on the lingual aspect of incisor and also on the palatal aspect of a molar. Let me just zoom in. So this extra formation of enamel is considered as tubercle. So also you can notice here the cusp of carabelli which is nothing but a form of tubercle right now coming to the next term cingulum so cingulum is also called as girdle it's because girdle is nothing but a belt like structure so similarly this cingulum represents a girdle which is present in the cervical third of lingual aspect of anterior teeth and it's usually present convex mesodistally so in this image you can see on the lingual surface in the cervical third we find a girdle or a convex structure extending mesodistally which is called as cingulum and this cingulum represents lingual lobe so we have different lobes from which an anterior tooth develops we have a mesial lobe distal lobe central lobe and a lingual lobe usually mesial distal and central lobe are represented as mammalons and lingual lobe is represented as cingulum in case of anterior teeth that's very important right Coming to the next term, a ridge. As you can see in this beautiful image, a ridge is nothing but a linear elevation, right? So these are some of the hills where you can see ridges, right? So even on tooth, we have linear elevations on the surface, on the occlusal surface. So we have different kinds of ridge. We have marginal ridge, transverse ridge, oblique ridge, and triangular ridge. Now let's discuss each ridge in detail. So coming to marginal ridge, as the name itself indicates, these elevated linear elevations are present on the margin. So they can be present on the mesial and distal aspects of premolars or molars, or they can be present in case of lingual surfaces of anterior teeth right so these marginal ridges are rounded borders of enamel they are present mesial and distal margins of occlusal surfaces of posteriors and also they are present on lingual surfaces of anteriors now let's see the diagrams so this is a lingual surface of an anterior where you can clearly appreciate rounded linear elevations found on mesial and distal aspect so these are the marginal ridges right the ridges present on the margins so this is the molar as you can clearly see a linear elevation along the mesial and the distal aspect of the tooth and these are called as marginal ridges mesial marginal ridge and distal marginal ridge respectively and then we have another term called as triangular ridge so as the name itself indicates the shape of this ridge is triangular. So these triangular ridges descend from the tips of cusps of molars and premolars towards the central part of occlusal surface, right? And examples include triangular ridge of buccal cusp of maxillary first premolar. As you can see in this image, let me just zoom in. So this is the maxillary first premolar. You can see that from the cusp tip, there are two slopes which are descending towards the central bit. So since the slopes resemble the sides of a triangle, these are called as triangular ridges. So the best example is triangular ridge of buccal cusp of maxillary first premolar, right? So we have another term called as transverse ridge which is formed by union of two triangular ridges. So when a buccal triangular ridge and lingual triangular ridge combined together and traverse the occlusal surface then we call it as transverse ridge. So it's formed by joining of buccal and lingual triangular ridges and as you can see in this image so this is a maxillary first molar this is a mesopalatal cusp distobuccal cusp and this is the oblique ridge whereas you can see that the triangular ridges of these mesopalatal and mesobuccal cusps joining right. So this ridge which is traversing the occlusal surface can be considered as a transverse ridge. And then coming to oblique ridge, ridge obliquely crossing the occlusal surface of maxillary molars. 
it's formed by union of this is very important so the cusps which are being joined by this oblique ridge are mesoparietal and distal buccal and to be more specific it's formed by union of triangular ridge of distal buccal cusp and distal cusp ridge of mesolingual cusp so let's see in this image so this is a mesoparietal cusp and this is a distal buccal cusp so this oblique ridge is formed by union of the triangular ridge of distal buccal cusp and the distal cusp ridge of mesoparietal cusp and this extra prominence is cusp of caribelli which represents the fifth cusp right so this is about oblique ridge usually seen in case of maxillary first molars and then coming to fossa as the name itself indicates it's an irregular depression or concavity so it's formed by convergence of ridges terminating at central point in bottom of depression where a junction of grooves occurs so we have different fossas like lingual fossa central fossa mesial and distal triangular fossa etc so as you can see in this illustration so these triangular ridges or ridges which converge towards the center lead to formation of depression either in the center of the tooth or on the mesial and distal aspects of the tooth which are called as fossas and these fossas usually contain various developmental grooves right so that's important and coming to sulcus a sulcus is a long depression or valley between ridges and cusps the inclines of which meet at a particular angle so we have various ridges and also cusps right so we can consider these as ridges and we have these cusps so when these cusps and ridges converge we have a depression a long depression usually in these areas and these are considered as sulci right sulci is a plural name and sulcus is a singular so these sulci usually contain developmental grooves right so that's important so let me just repeat this the so sulcus is a long depression or valley which is present between the ridges and cusps the inclines of which meet at a particular angle a sulcus has a developmental groove at the junction of its inclines right so we have the junction of the inclines like we have a ridge here and a cusp here so at this junction we have grooves and this long depression is considered as sulci right so that's about sulcus and then coming to developmental groove so we have usually at the developmental stage of any tooth different lobes contribute to formation of of crown so when these lobes perfectly coalesce they tend to form something called as groove right whereas when there is imperfect coalescence of these lobes then there is something called as fissure so there is a major difference between a groove and fissure so in case of grooves it's a shallow linear depression it's a shallow linear depression between the primary parts of a crown or root so as i said we have different lobes so these constitute the primary parts because of the perfect coalescence of these lobes there is formation of this groove and also we have another type of groove called as supplemental groove which is less distinct compared to the developmental groove examples include in case of molars we have mesobuccal groove distal buccal groove and also lingual groove right so these are some of the examples of developmental grooves and most commonly we have palatogingival grooves in case of maxillary lateral incisors right that's very important and in this image or illustration you can see the presence of various grooves which represent the areas of union of developmental lobes right and coming to pits so fossa is a irregular concave depression whereas a pit is a pinpoint depression so pinpoint depressions located at junctions of developmental grooves or at the terminals of those grooves so we have various grooves here right so at the junction of the grooves we have pinpoint depressions called pits or we can also find these pits at the terminus or at the ending point of these grooves example buccal pit palatal pit etc and these do not come under self cleansing area pits fissures grooves they are not included under self cleansing areas right whereas the cusp tips cusps ridges and the smooth surfaces come under self cleansing areas so examples include central pit of molars so it's evident here right now coming to lobe so lobe is one of the primary sections of formation and development of crown that's very important the cusps and mamelons are representative of lobes let's try to understand this so let's look at various teeth and the number of lobes they are being developed from this is very important most of the teeth in oral cavity develop from four lobes so that's a standard rule so the minimum number of lobes from which permanent teeth develop are four right and as you can see here we have certain exceptions apart from this 
a three cusp type mandibular second premolar usually mandibular second premolar we have two cusp pattern and three cusp pattern if a third cusp is present it's present on the lingual aspect then we have a buccal cusp mesolingual cusp and distolingual cusp so in that scenario that tooth develops from five lobes and also permanent maxillary first molar and permanent mandibular first molar which have five cusps develop from five lobes and primary maxillary second molar and primary mandibular second molar which morphologically resemble permanent first molars also develop from five lobes and we have primary incisors which develop from a single lobe so this is in brief about various teeth and the number of lobes they are developing from this is very very important right and as you can see in this illustration it shows the development of an incisor from different number of lobes so as you can see here as i mentioned previously in the table incisors permanent teeth usually develop from four lobes so here you can see a distal lobe a central lobe and a mesial lobe and also we have another lobe on the lingual surface that is represented later as a cingulum right so we have totally four lobes and these three lobes that is a distal central and mesial lobe are represented as mammalons in an young erupted tooth right that's important and coming to mammalons as we have discussed in the previous slide it's any one of the three rounded protuberances found on incisal edge right and these are seen in newly erupted teeth so in this image clinical image you can clearly notice the mammalons so we have three mammalons more or less right so each mammalon represents one particular lobe right so usually these mammalons get attrited with time and the incisal edge becomes or appears more or less flatter right so this is in brief about mammalons and finally coming to roots so usually maxillary mandibular teeth have either one root or multiple roots so the maxillary and mandibular anteriors that is central laterals and canines usually have one root with an exception of mandibular canine where there can be a bifurcation if there is bifurcation we find two roots one buccally and one lingually so that's an exception and mandibular canine premolars and maxillary second premolars usually contain one root that's important except for maxillary first premolar where there are two roots which are present buccally and lingually and maxillary molars as you all know they contain three roots a mesobuccal root distobuccal root and a palatal root and mandibular molars have two roots one root present mesially and one root present distally so this is not a hard and fast rule there can be many exceptions to this so this is a general finding which we notice in most of the patients that is very important so this is an image which represents crowns and roots of various teeth right so as you can see here we have bifurcations or two roots in case of maxillary first premolar present buccally and lingually and also we have maxillary first molar which has three roots mesobuccal root distobuccal root and the palatal root and usually in case of anteriors we have more or less a single root and also in case of mandibular premolars and maxillary second premolar we have a single root right so this is in brief about various landmarks of natural teeth and now let's discuss various multiple choice questions pertaining to these topics so coming to the first question the minimum number of developmental lobes in permanent teeth is 2145 asked in previous aims 2012 and aapg 2014 so as i mentioned in the table the minimum number of lobes for development of permanent teeth is 4 but in case of primary teeth the primary incisors develop from a single lobe right so the answer here is 4 come to the next question palto gingival groove is found in maxillary lateral maxillary first premolar maxillary first molar and all of the above so palto gingival groove is a characteristic finding of maxillary lateral incisor next question the total number of cingular in each dentition is usually cingular represented by lingual lobe they are present in anterior teeth so we have 12 anterior teeth right uh, three per quadrant central lateral and canine so we have a total of 12 cingular right and the number of roots in maxillary second molar is 2 3 4 and 5 so obviously maxillary molars they have three roots mesobuccal distobuccal and palatal root mandibular second premolar three cusp type is developed from so two cusp type develops from four lobes whereas three cusp type it develops from five lobes right so the answer here is five next question an 8 year old child comes to clinic with large front teeth having jagged margins 
jagged or irregular margins. What is the treatment plan? Option A, smoothen the jagged margins and apply fluoride varnish. Option B, build up other teeth to large size. Option C, extraction of big teeth. Option D, assure him and send him back. Asked in AAPG 2009. So when a child comes with jagged margins, it's nothing but presence of mammalons, right? Since the age of the patient is 8 years, the central incisors and lateral should have erupted at that particular time period. So we should reassure the patient because mammalons are a normal anatomical finding and usually they get treated with time, right? So the option here is option D, assure him and send him back. However, this is only theoretically possible because most practicing dentists in a private setup usually follow option A they smoothen the margins apply varnish and ask the patient to come back periodically which shouldn't be done right and coming to the next question the ridge that descends from the cuspal tip towards the central part of the occlusal surface in maxillary molares so a triangular ridge is a ridge which descends from the cusp tip towards the central part of the occlusal surface when two triangular ridges of opposite sides meet together then we call it as transverse ridge and if a ridge crosses a surface obliquely then it's called as oblique ridge so these triangular ridges are characteristically found in the buccal cusp tip of maxillary first premolar Come to the next question. Linear depression on a tooth surface is pit, groove, fossa, and sulcus. Asked in Comet 2015. So a long depression is a sulcus. Whereas fossa is an irregular depression which contains numerous developmental grooves terminating at that particular area. Whereas pit is a pinpoint depression. However, a groove is a linear shallow depression found on tooth surface, right? That's important. Whereas a fissure is something which is deeper compared to a groove, right? Come to the next question. The crown of any tooth can be subdivided for description into halves, thirds, quarters and eighths. So we can divide the surface of a crown, for example the labial surface into cervical third, middle third and incisal third or occlusal third. So we can divide the crowns into thirds. So option B is the appropriate answer here asked in Kerala 2016. So coming to the final question. One of the following dental notations is known as universal notation. Zygmondi notation, Cunningham notation, Navy notation, Palmer notation. It's asked in previous Kerala 2016. So while discussing one of the videos on tooth numbering systems, I haven't mentioned this point. That's the reason why I'm discussing this here. So usually Zygmondi Palmer system is called a symbolic system, right? So it's not universal. Navy notation is also not called as universal notation. However, we have something called as Cunningham notation, which is called as universal notation. So Cunningham notation or universal numbering system was first introduced by Cunningham in 1883. It's official tooth designation system in USA adopted by ADA since 1975. And usually this system uses Arabic numbers 1 to 32 for numbering permanent teeth and alphabet system A to T for deciduous teeth moving in clockwise direction. As specific numbers are employed for each tooth, it reduces the risk of mistakes. So each tooth has a unique number and also data can be easily entered in a system or a computer or a typewriter because in Zygmandi Palmer we have a grid system which is difficult to enter whereas this universal system given by Cunningham is comparatively easy to enter, right? So this is the representation of Cunningham system of deciduous teeth where you can see the alphabets being used for uh, denoting various primary teeth as we move, move on in clockwise direction right starting from a and ending at t right so these are some of the important points pertaining to various landmarks of teeth and also i've seen several multiple choice questions pertaining to this topic right hope it's clear thank you